Hi, good morning. Good morning, Amelia. Hi. Hello. Aditi. Yes. I saw the most wonderful YouTube video. Uh -huh. on a, just a, this big. He was only this big. A little fat black spider uh -huh. with big eyes. Uh -huh. And do you know, he was a devoted pet to this lady. Really? A spider? She was. Oh my she God. was a devoted pet, wouldn't leave her, would eat from her hand, everything. But when she wanted to build a web, then she used to say, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Please stay away. And after she finished building her web, she would come right back, most apologetically, and just sit there either on her hand or her shoulder. Wow. So she was such an adorable little spider. Little <laughs> black, uh, hairy spider. She was not one of those spindly ones, oh. a little one. With big, you know how many eyes they have, but you have yeah. two <laughs> big eyes and you'd be staring at her like this. And this was a video. I mean, you know, it wasn't just a story that I saw. So they are That's rather so cute. cute. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered Each whether one of sex could be. They have personalities. Yes, they do. They must have. Yeah. Even in sex. Good morning. Good morning. I was just trying to tell you that they're not as bad as they seem. <laughs> <laughs> Reptiles? Spiders. <clears throat> Spiders. Anything other than snakes are not as bad as they seem. <laughs> oh, snakes are quite nice. You must come to the Pune uh, snake farm. And there's a lovely, I mean, it's a very sad <laughs> no. for the little. No, no, there's a yellow, there's a yellow snake, which they keep next to them so that children can come and pet him. So that they get used to the idea that uh, they're not right. slimy, they're not wet, they're dry. And the poor chap seems more frightened than the children, you know. He just kind of shrinks. I feel very bad for him. Oh, I'm just sure. Just there to pet, yeah. So sad. Yeah. Yeah. Ekbak will yeah. be uh, Paru's nightmare. We just going to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's not even... Let, let. Not even think about it. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Aditi, today I'm just watching. Okay. Because my hand has just completely gone for a toss. This whole nerve from here, from these two fingers all the way up to my neck has oh my God. jammed up and I'm in a lot of pain. Okay, it's so not because happens periodically it? from time to time. What Sorry? Is what is it from? Is it not from... because of writing or something? No, from working, no, when I'm cutting and doing like coloring, cutting, doing all that. Mm. Sometimes it just uh, this this muscle over here just tightens up and then it just kind of the whole thing jams up. So today I'll just watch. All right. Do you do yoga, Paru? I don't do yoga. I do uh, other like functional fitness. I don't do, do yoga. I would recommend yoga for anybody who is doing more than an hour of art a week. Because uh, there's, okay. that's the only way I can work. There's no... I was in this uh, state in 2015 mm. after I participated at Kala Ghoda. My shoulders had become mm. like a rock. And the mm. same thing, mm. laying and couldn't Very. work, being on the laptop for hours. And, uh, and it took me six months yeah. of yoga practice to straighten all that. And it's this index finger and index finger and thumb. Yeah. Yeah. I'm generally okay. It doesn't this happen after a very long time. But um, generally, yeah, Kala Ghoda is a big precipitator. When I work for Kala Ghoda, then it's like three, four months of continuous work and then finish this is like jammed. <laughs> yeah, you should you should try so, find a yoga class just for this, if nothing else. There's no... I, I, will like I have found no other solution. I've done running, gym, massages, uh, all sorts. Yeah. But only this season. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's continue with the tragopan from yesterday, uh, last week.
there's just a few things that I wanted to add to that. Uh, a few more details. By now, the color has dried. So you see how um, the picture truly looks. And we have to address the feathers at the back of uh, its head and the body. So what I've done is I've made a lighter shade along the shoulder, a darker shade around the front. And we can reinforce this uh, or we can, um, and then we can build in those white dots. So if you have the white pen or the glass pencil or the pens that um, Baru had recommended, then great. If not, we can also try using um, the white paint from the kit itself. So a little bit of um, the paint from the bottom might rise into the white, but it's a fairly opaque color, so it might uh, it might work. All right. So what I'm going to do now is first give uh, a second wash, not a wash actually, do a more specific illustration over here. So I will, you can mark out certain areas with pencil so that you know exactly where to make those shapes. Start off with these almost teardrop shape feathers almost one behind, uh, one below the other. They're fairly small, but they're quite distinct. So they're not exactly one below the other, and they're not exactly the same distance apart. In order to make the bird look more natural, we need to follow these kind of discrepancies. And you can paint out that white dot in all these feathers. There's one feather here. And then the few over here. So many of them are just overlapping each other. It's important that you don't make it look like a pattern because this is not a graphic image. In a graphic, we can just make this as a very regular pattern throughout. Now the same thing can be done over here, but it can take a lot of time to make this feather by feather. So we can create a silhouette of the outlines of some of the feathers along the edge. We can insert a little bit of red between these. So between this line of feathers and this silhouette, there is one more line. So keep looking at the reference image. Don't ease up. Every layer of color will make the uh, illustration darker and deeper. And this particular black, you can add a little bit of burnt umber to make it, and uh, cobalt blue, to make it like a multi-color black. So I'm going to paint that silhouette in.
So here it's pretty much looking like a mala. But if that's how it's on the picture, reference image, then I guess that's how we have to go with it. Now, there's another way we can do this is by just using brush strokes like these to fill up this space. I just want you to see this. Maybe because it's black, you might not be able to. But just using brush strokes, fill in this space with in a texture form instead of painting it flat. Though the whole thing might look black in the end, these little things are just subtle discrepancies that can be caught by the eye. Can you see? It's a little patchy in texture. So I tend to maintain that Hi. Who's this? This is Daisy. Daisy. Even my Daisy is right here. Oh. <laughs> She's sitting there. Yeah. Oh, she's so cute. What breed is she? She's a cat or she's a dog? She's a cat. She's a cat, no? Feet cat, yeah. <laughs> All right. No. See, <laughs> she's curious to see what is going on. Okay, finally we're on. Okay, so my texture has dried, so you can see that there are a few light patches over here, which makes it look uh, more natural than if we had made a flat patch of black over there. And then we can go ahead and paint these other feathers also, but with a reasonably smaller brush. So again, when we're painting feathers, one thing to keep in mind is that feathers have got uh, edges. And they're not smooth edges. So if we paint them like this, it will appear like that, right? So what we can do for a change over here, that which I keep telling you not to do, you can do over here to your heart's content. Paint in short bursts. So do this and end the edges such that they are not smooth. So make that circle and then end the edge like this. Now, another thing that we can do while we're here is take an even thinner brush. This was, I think, a number two. So I'm taking a number one now. And I'm creating the negative texture on the feathers also. So I want you to just observe this. You don't have to do this because it can be very tedious. And uh, knowing me, I will take this on just because... Um, it's a challenge. So I'm going to make lines, very fine lines like feathers in this direction, going along the shoulder. And I'll keep changing the direction of the line. So this is going to imitate the, the effect of those white feathers.
So here we need to make the lines very undulating and pretty tiny, but not make them horizontal. So don't be tempted to make a horizontal line. That's where the tedious part comes in. The horizontal single line versus maybe 30 lines, 30 tiny lines. So I prefer to keep it authentic as far as possible. But I know that that's not, that's not something that everyone enjoys. So if you're not going to enjoy it, don't bother with this. So in this way, little by little, that whole pattern will start emerging. So if we don't do that texture, then the this these feathers are going to stand out quite stark. The lines that we are making here, also they're not all in the same direction. They're not the same height or thickness or length, length of that sequence of lines. It's all different. They're all merging into each other. So keep looking at the original image at every point to see how you can do this. So now if I just cover this, you will notice how the picture is looking more and more complete. And the texture around the sides of the feathers also is making sense. Now, all the colors along the side also can be brightened if you want to. I'm just going to leave it like that. Then we can complete it later because it's more of the same thing. And in other places, we can increase the depth of color. Now, remember that um, once we have a particular color background, we can add other colors to, to this and they would create a third color. So what I mean by that is over here, we have a much deeper reddish brown. So I'm mixing burnt umber, light red, 
a little bit of crimson and if need be a little bit of ultramarine blue as well to get the a very deep brown shade that's light red burnt umber crimson and ultramarine blue and this will now make for a nice uh, overlay and deepen the whole crest. So in this case as well, you can take larger strokes and manipulate your brush so that they cover a large area in one shot. Wherever the, the feathers are not seen, you can also do this. And then you can go over a second time run. So this is, a, I think, a six number brush. And I'm just occupying that area. And wherever we don't have that light, um, light colored feathers shining through, make it dark. Okay, now again the colors around the face can be deepened. So we can make a mix of uh, orange and scarlet. And just apply it around here. Now here, please be careful because you've already applied a lot of other color. So I just wanted to see how I'm doing this. I'm applying some color here. But I'm also spreading that color out towards the edges in such a way that they look like the ridges of the face, that whole texture. So, because now I can't blend it, I am spreading it like it's a uh, part of the texture of the face. So this way you can insert new color also and you can create the texture without having to use black. Anytime you see a black line in a very colorful image, try to see if there's any other color that you can substitute it with. A deeper version of the same color will also be fine. Now with the rest of the texture, you can use cobalt blue or even cerulean blue and continue this texture 
just make sure that it's not just all one squiggle shape. Study the squiggles a little bit. They are almost like a, a squarish spiral that goes into each other. And here as well, the same thing applies. So we can add a nice mix of cobalt blue and ultramarine blue along the edge. and then pull the texture out. Remember to keep your paint very dry. Now, if you're unsure about this texture, first, please try it in rough. Make sure that it matches the texture that you see on the reference image and only then come ahead and do it on the board. Never under, underestimate the uh, the value of rough work. So in these places, we can add a little more cerulean blue. And because now we have filled in the red, this is how you can do it. Just add it along the edges. And then with a damp brush, the same brush, just wipe it, wash it, wipe it. And using that damp brush, spread that blue into the area that you need it. So you need a very small amount of the blue because otherwise it will not, cerulean blue also can be very dark. So make sure that you use it at 50% intensity, not more than that. So it's, it looks much brighter than the earlier colors. Okay, and the last thing is let's test out the white dots. This is actually the most fun and dramatic parts of an illustration when the white emerges. We're going to look lovely. So only on the feathers that I've finished the final touch, I have put white. And on the front, they're slightly bigger. Be careful about positioning 
and shaping these ovals. Don't just make them anywhere at random. Notice how every alternate row is slightly offset a little bit. They're not next to each other. As we turn around the body, these dots will naturally come a little closer to each other. So how much closer and where you will place them is uh, worth giving a thought. Huh? Don't just blindly do it. So this creates the illusion of uh, turning body. Okay, any questions so far? All okay? All right. So I'll leave this for you all to complete because the uh, remaining is pretty much the same. Let's see Amulya's. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Very nice. I don't have a white pen, but I go, I did it with a white paint, but it keeps merging, you know. It but keeps I'll, do it later. I'll do it later when we get a little better. Yeah. Right? Oh. oh, Elaine, avoid what? avoid painting along the edge. Huh? Like you. <laughs> I know I didn't have that tape. I couldn't find. No, but that's yeah, I have found the oh. tape. Yeah. No, bring bring it. Oh, you side. mean right to the edge of the book? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Avoid this because uh, you don't have any room around it to appreciate. The picture. So yeah, this looks a little. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, okay. I'll remember. Okay, all right. So, shall we move on to the insects? I haven't found a picture of a cricket, uh, Elaine. Ah, never mind. It was just a thought that we were doing very safe butterflies. When the animal, the insect kingdom has a huge amount of... But I think people don't like the others. No, no. They're, some of them are very, very... Uh, I mean, they're all very beautiful. But uh, there are few challenges in them. It's just about maybe color and proportion. Yeah. But with moths and butterflies, because of the fact that they are symmetrical, they often pose a challenge. So they seem safe because yeah. the colors and all are interesting. But I've tried, I've tried doing, um, the beetles are tough to do because their colors are so iridescent. You never find the satisfactory combination. So then that's very frustrating. And uh, other insects like grasshoppers or uh, um, yeah, crickets, they have a very beautiful complex mouth. Uh, but then that becomes like an, we need to do a more detailed drawing of that. So we'll do it at some point. They're very lovely to draw as well. Okay. Maybe we'll do an animated, you know, one of those, what do they call graphic? Uh... Hmm. of a cricket how they have all these animated movies with these crickets which never look so you know their mouth parts and all can look pretty dreadful otherwise but in the in the animations they look very cute because they leave all that out right? yeah yeah they anthropomorphize everything anything that will look pleasing to human children human act yeah. <laughs> So they will just have one mouth and not so many mouth parts and there's two eyes and not ten. So it's interesting how what how we find certain things 
pleasing or beautiful and something's ugly when objectively speaking they're just performing a function all right um so i have shared a bunch of moths and a bunch of butterflies uh, I hope you all are aware of the differences. There's, I, I love that there are such cute differences between moths and butterflies. If not, just look them up. They're very interesting to, to know. Uh, but the two are similar in the sense that both of them have colorful wings. And um, drawing them, because they're symmetrical, can be a bit of a challenge. So I just want to break that a little bit. I'm not moving too far away from our usual uh, scale and uh, proportion drawing. Uh, just a new way of looking at things which are more symmetrical. The other thing also is the various colors. So we are going to do a little more of color blending into these. And I'll show you a simple technique by which we can paint these butterflies. So what I would like is if you're, in order to practice this, make a series of moths or butterflies. Again, just make eight or nine of them and compose them and put them up somewhere. So one of the pictures I've shared is a composition of butterflies. Something similar can also be done. Okay. Yeah, this is a nice compilation. Now here also, I don't know whether it was intentional or whether it just happened by accident. This creates a very nice color story. A lot of the colors are good with each other, the pink and the light green. Then these two tie into the green butterfly on the right and then at the bottom. And the lighter colors are the same tone as these pinks. And then of course the brown, brown, brown. So how you compose a picture in terms of colors is a very important exercise. And of course, this may not be the only right way to do it. If you're given 100 butterflies, this is one of maybe 10 options of colors and shapes put together. But the reason I added this was when you are making a composition or when you come across a composition like that, you should try and see, firstly, does it resonate with you? Does it seem equally beautiful? and intriguing enough to grab your attention. Because these are the plates that can make you build your color stories. We can pick up any five or six colors of, or shades from this composition and then go on and make some kind of like a William Morris pattern. That is how patterns are designed and colors and patterns are chosen. But the color stories are built like this, organic elements put together studied and literally uh, col colors are picked up from those. Okay. Here are our insects. So I'm going to give you a way to make a grid for insects. Always orient the picture in such a way that you can see the body of the insect upright. So this uh, image was actually sideways. Now, I would avoid drawing objects which are bifurcated sideways so that you have one wing pointing up and one wing pointing down. For some reason, we are better able to see symmetry left and right rather than top and bottom because it's in the same plane. Our estimates of distances from side to side are as is flawed, but if I were to turn this around, that would be even more flawed. So turn it around and then we're just going to go with lines first. So let's draw a straight line for the body. And with respect to this line, we have the body of the insect about, let's say, one quarter of its length. So the width of the body is one quarter. And an oval shape can be drawn till about the first top quarter. Then you have, I think this is the thorax, if I'm not mistaken, and then you have the head and eyes. These tiny shapes, even if they're not exactly in proportion, can you can get an idea about 
how to draw these or how big to draw them. The smaller shapes are fairly easy. It's the only the question of larger shapes. You need to have some kind of proportion. Now from the thorax, you have one wing going out to about eight o'clock. And we have one definite line, which is the end of the body. So we can draw the other line going to five o'clock. So we have eight o'clock, we have five o'clock. And then this line you can divide in half, half, and we can get an indication now of where the turn comes in terms of, for this wing, the turn comes higher. Where the wing turns downward, goes below that baseline. And this one extends and turns and the corner comes on, on top of the baseline. The next is a line that goes between seven and eight. So here you've got maybe seven o'clock, eight, seven, six, and this will actually be four, and this would be five. So you have four, five, six, right? And now it's just joining these two points with an elegant curve. This one is slightly higher and shallower. This one is slightly lower and longer. That's about it. Now, when it comes to making the legs, also notice how the legs always start. I think the legs are always attached to the thorax, not the body, but Anybody who's done etymology, entomology, please, I'm happy to be corrected. And I think they have three part legs or something like that. So they're just short lines, which we can observe from the picture. That's about it. And then, of course, you have these. The antennae of the moth, they're hairy. So you can just, we're going to illustrate this with just gray lines. So at every point, we need to find at least three items which are totally objective. One is the central spine, which gives us some starting point then you have the directions objective directions you know where eight o'clock and seven o'clock are four o'clock and five o'clock are they're objective there aren't any discrepancy is there and then you have the intersection of some of these lines like this is the eight o'clock line intersects with a horizontal line that is perpendicular to the base of the body so at least three such elements and then everything else can be constructed on top of that because you can half the lines and you can make circles. All of that can be built up on that. So look for three things. Okay. I'll share that image. Now here again is the same thing, but here the... Uh, I the insect is at an angle. So we're going to have to create an angular illustration. Now over here, there are three parts and they are not exactly one third, but thereabouts. So you don't always have to convert an image to, or the first guideline to half and quarters. Even something like that when you have distinct markings can be made. And use your discretion to see that the top and the bottom part are longer than the middle part. And the top part has got the mouth at about whatever x distance. Then you have these, this second line extending. And then you have 
lines out and how much is it extending because now here we also have a teardrop shape right then if this is our horizontal line that is perpendicular to the main spine then what are the angles these wings are making and measure the length of the wing by the height of the body. Even that is good enough. And then, of course, we can make the curve. The curves on these wings, notice how the top is a very nice rounded rectangle shape and the bottom is a very circular shape. These shapes are very important to draw as accurately as possible. All right, now the last one, the difference between a moth and a butterfly. Let me go, let me show you this. So in this butterfly, I'm going to start with the same kind of line. This is the main central line. Divide the butterfly's body into one third and two third. And here's the main difference. The butterfly's wings are start and go up from the middle while a moth's wings all come down from the top of the head they all come down butterflies wings go up as well as come down so you can draw a line that is horizontal to the main body at two thirds from the top and on each side you will measure how long the wingspan is more often than not, each side, the wing is about the same height as the height of the body. Now we come to drawing these angles. And when you draw the angle on top, look for a, a straight line that goes from mid to tip. Because it's easier to just draw like almost a circle or an arch than to draw the whole shape like that. So break it up. Here again we have an angle. Here again, give yourself this angle. And then the Wing is almost like a, an oval shape. Right? And here again we have at what point do we mark the tiny drop like feature of the lower wings? So let's try making this butterfly first. So I can show you the color mixing over here. Okay. For every part over here, try and proportion it either visually or actually measure it. Like for example, if this is the height of the butterfly, the width of these ovals and at what point is it the most width? Where do you have to draw it? All these things are important. Okay, and as always, I will mention that this is just one way of measuring the or drawing a grid or guidelines for the butterflies. But if you see other shapes that you find easy for you to recognize, please go ahead with those. All right, now seeing that the butterflies wings go higher, we can make our first line a little lower in the page. So if you look at the, sorry, one second. Yeah, 
If you look at the butterfly, the wings go almost the same height on top as the body of the butterfly. It's right in the middle over here. The same height up and the same height bottom. That's how big we want to make it. So if you think of it in three parts, your body should be somewhere over here. Make this line, divide it into one third and two third. And at half of one third, make the head. And about the same width, make thorax, which comes down into a very narrow shape. Now the same height, you draw a line of the same length as the height of the butterfly along the side. They don't have to be identical and they don't have to be exactly straight. One can be slightly higher, one can be slightly lower. And we turn this around like so. And then you have a line that goes mm -hmm. up from the same point. It goes to about one o'clock, between one and two and outward. This can also be measured in terms of height of body. I prefer to do it visually by now. And then you would draw a curve. The edge on top is, this is not flat. I think this will make, I'll make it rounder because it's looking very odd if I make it flat. Now in this case, I'm just gonna make an oval shape right now because the pattern on the butterfly is going to inform, be informed by, I uh, say so the edge is going to be informed by the pattern. Okay, now we have to make the pattern. So for the top, notice how there is almost a almost angular teardrop shape in the middle with a dot somewhere at pointing towards two o'clock and over here ten o'clock. And before we proceed, actually, I'm gonna. It is the straight line so that I can then paint over. This can be the final line. I don't have to. I don't have to then erase everything. So at least the straight lines and the lines which are inaccurate, I can erase at this point. And I can use the existing, the design that we're making now as a final pattern. It will be an underlay first, and then I can deepen it. So there's a slightly thick line on the top. From here, there are, I think, one, two, and three scallop-like segments on both sides. So that's one, two, three. One thing about 
things like butterflies or moths try to make if they have any patterns make both patterns at the same time both side patterns then you have a line that goes almost like in a v shape on the side one more on this side and i think there's one more before it finishes Similarly, at the bottom, you have a very angular shaped teardrop. From here, you have just lines going out to maybe between eight and nine, then eight o'clock here, eight and seven, seven o'clock. So there's a number of lines which are radiating out from the wing. And uh, please look at the lines when you're making them. Don't just assume that they're there. This is Daisy coming today. Too. Hi, Daisy. Oh, okay. I, butterfly has been captured. Can I do something with you? <laughs> I jacked. Oh, -ho. <laughs> when she does this, you should just give her that. You should draw her. I know, I know. So cute. I draw it. that shape is so nice. Yeah. Daisy does stay put. Beautiful head. <laughs> okay, I'll give her something else to rest. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> So once you have these lines, then you will have certain, at least an idea of what kind of shapes you want. Like from here, you have a shape that goes almost horizontal. Then you have V shapes on all sides, on all these. Some are V, some are like little rectangles. So it helps to draw these shapes in tandem with each other. Now, once you get a proportion over here, it becomes easier to then draw the outside shape. So don't bother making the outside shape beforehand. Right at this point where you have one, two, somewhere over here is where you have this shape coming down. It's fairly vertical to form a what kind of droplet and then the other shapes around follow the edge according to the pattern made here now here we have to try to make a mirror line So what I found is often the mistake people make is the rush with which you want to make the outline. And 
then try to fill in the inside. Whereas it's exactly the opposite. The outside is the way it is because of the inside. So you might as well first draw the inside and then go outside. Now, coloring this is good fun. First, because for a change, we are going to be using viridian. We hardly use viridian. So we can make a nice mix of even viridian and cerulean. And even though the color is really light, avoid the temptation of adding white to this. You really don't need to. All right. So this is my cerulean viridian mix i'm going to make a small patch here to test it out so it's fairly dark so i'm going to lighten it a little bit and just give a wash along the sides like that let a little extra go into the black area. Now pull the color towards the center. And at this point now, you can just put in a dab of the concentrated color, just a little bit, so that you get a very dramatic dark section over here the center. When you are painting this, flatten your brush a little bit. Now, often, again, what can happen is you should try and wait between wings so that you don't disturb these. Now, these two are not connected, so it doesn't matter. But the bottom is connected to the top. So don't be in a rush to paint this. Here is... It's again the same thing. And here we can try another way of blending where you start off with a light color, pull it in, take a slightly more intense shade, pull it in. So a little more concentrated color. And then, of course, an even deeper color, which could be a concentrated uh, cerulean and viridian. So this part is where you are free. 
Let me get a slightly deeper color in. And then concentrated viridian pencil. At this point, also put a little bit of this green color along the central spine. And a little on the head. Now, as the color dries, before we go into making black, there are a few places where we can make this color slightly deeper. So here we can use a thin brush for a little bit of brush manipulation. So here you have a few strokes that are darker along the edge, maybe something like that. So I'm not making it on both sides right now, just so that you get to see how it looks. And because these strokes require for us to go outward into the black, it's good to make these before you make the blacks. Now, these dark patches are not identical on both sides. There's a little shadow underneath the wing on top. And as I see it, there's also some additional blue along this edge of the wings. Just a deeper bottom here. Once right, so this is done, we just dip into black and paint the rest. Now, this is also an example where if your color is really dark and the black that we have is not sufficient, consider painting the black part in waterproof ink instead of watercolor. Because so long as that it's a liquid medium, it would have a similar finish as opposed to maybe making it with a micron tip pen or a marker you don't want to do that. But ink should be fine. Now, when you're painting the black, also please check that you've got the proportion right. Only when you're painting it will you really see the proportion.
Here I'm making the edges with vertical lines, like we made the edge of the dragon's face where the feathers came. Because that way then I get a very organic line as opposed to making the lines very flat. Now, when you're making this shape, keep your book upright till you make all the demarcations. And then, if you want, you can turn the book to a more convenient angle to continue painting. Never paint specifics of anything uh, un unless you keep the, or you can keep the artwork right side up. Our perception of Upside down, left to right, mirror opposites is very, very flawed. And very often the drawing is not accurate. So use a very thin brush for this, the final edging. Once this is done, you can then use a nice fine brush or brush clip to define the lines. Now, all the other textures that you see like we did the, the white small wings of the dragon pan you can always make the light uh, light black shade and you can keep on building with the turquoise shade that we've made. That's not really important. Decide on whether or not you want to make any further texture to this only after you finish making all the wings. Your line can come, come much closer.
Now for the face, again, I would make a few, uh, I would blank out, uh, I mean, or, or not paint in a few places. So I have two highlights over here. I don't know whether that's the eyes. It almost looks like a smiley face. So I'm going to keep it like that. There's a fuzz, but we can't translate fuzz into, right, other than just making um, textured lines. So in this case, you can use a, a dry brush effect. Don't take very thick paint and run it across the thorax like this. And then build the body. Around that green patch that we painted. There is a little bit of burnt umber there. So as relief, please do consider adding that burnt umber because it's just too black otherwise. Give us a, it'll give a certain warmth to the feature. And now here's one thing that a lot of times you make a mistake. When we are making the antenna of the butterfly, we tend to make them like the antenna of the moth. So a moth's antenna apparently curl outward, a butterfly's antenna go out and then come in. I don't know whether that is one of the differences, but I've seen that in many pictures. So we have a slightly thick end and then you have outside to in. So this goes inward and then outward. Thicker than I'd expected, but it's okay. Almost the thickness of a mark. Okay. Now we've given just one layer of paint here. That's why it's pretty light. If we go to give a second layer, then this would become a little more intense. So it's all up to you. And you can you can make a series of even like this uh, butterflies in um, construction and make a color chart of all the colors that you use in there. It will make a very nice illustrated sheet to display. See. Yeah. I haven't done the bottom. I did both the top ones. Oh. It's more difficult to see the other side. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that the right side of the butterfly has become a little flatter. It. I think you can extend it a little bit. Okay. Yes, this did have challenges, especially I'm challenged with washes. Mm. So I think it was good that we did something colorful because then the washes show up when they're uneven. It's a thing of, in fact, I wanted to ask you if you could do a, a session of different, it, it becomes difficult when it's large. When it's small, I can still manage. As soon as it's large, the it dries out and all puddles. There's always one or, the, one or the two. The puddle will be some, I mean, later on you'll see this edge, like you said, no? the water collects at the butterfly. Or it will be where you can see the joint mm. where my next brush strokes have come. So it's always a question of how thin the paint or when I add the next one. There are, there are a couple of other factors also. So size of brush matters. The moment your area increases, you have to change your brush size. 
So if you're going to make a wash on an A4 size paper, you need to use a flat brush, which is at least an inch in width. Okay. So because I, otherwise, it just doesn't carry enough water. By the time you're adding the next, it's dried up. No. So it, that's why we are not doing any artwork, which is very large. We're very trying large. to do it within an A5 size, about the palm of your hand. That's about as much as we want to do. Because I know we have these limitations. Yeah, because see this one is very slightly better than my earlier one, mm. the wash. It's a yeah. little better. The earlier, there were always puddles or something going on. So yeah. So at least this came out, as you said, don't let it dry out. Mm. So with washes, uh, let me just go over the process again. You have to make enough uh, pigment mix as you are going to need. So if you have a certain area, you start creating a larger volume of uh, pigment or medium. Brush size should be proportionate to the area that you're going to paint. Hold your book at a tilt always. Never keep it flat because the center of those puddles forming is when your book is flat. When you hold it upright and you're painting like this, half the work is done by gravity. That's why washes are done only in the beginning. Never make a wash after you have started painting the main picture. There's really no point unless you want to wash out that whole picture. So say, for example, I've created the silhouette of a building or something like that. But then I make a wash on it. What will happen is that the wash will dislodge all the medium. But then that might give a very foggy effect to my painting. That could be desirable. So... You need to know that the moment watercolor comes in contact with water again, it is going to dislodge. You have to just allow for it. So whenever we also layer one on top of the other, we have to be very careful that the that the next layer is drier than the wash. It cannot be wetter because then you will be removing the earlier paint. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. So the as we proceed layer upon layer. We have to make it thicker and thicker and thicker. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So for washes now, what I can suggest to you, Elaine, is just take a sheet of A4 size paper and take multiple colors and just practice going back and forth. So the trick is to keep it upright so that when you make your first wash that stripe of paint that you make, all the paint will accumulate towards the bottom. So it's like they've been held only by the dryness of the paper. The moment you make the second line, then they will come a notch lower and a notch lower. So you're guiding the paint to stain the next layer of paper. That's how you have to look at it. Aditi, what are you doing for the next uh, four um, classes? Next month is uh, portraiture. So we will be, we'll start out pencil sketches. We'll also be doing more of human figures this time because when we did pencil sketching, we did a little bit of the human face. So this time we will do that in color. And uh, we'll also do some abstract portraits, which are fun to make because they don't really require you to make a face look like somebody or the other. But you can present a very nice um, like face for a card or a graphic with those portraits. So we will do something that is more contemporary and, and less uh, final. And uh, we'll study the proportions and all. To some extent, the yes. that yeah. uh, for the face, for the face, the okay. body, uh, but we are not going to do them in the fine art school okay. style because that will take us uh, six months of just that study. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. It's no. too detailed. But we will go through making a grid for the face. Uh, for no, no, I just wanted to study that. I just wanted to learn the, you know, just the bare minimum, but that's something I've always struggled with. 
yeah. is the proportions. And even from the first class to now, what you've taught us with working with a grid, uh, I found really helpful to apply it to, you know, even other, for like still life painting or whatever. I mean, able to understand positioning and proportion a lot better than mm -hmm. before. Yeah. Good, I'm good. Really you see, lost for the proportion. <laughs> It's good to apply that. There's lots of ways that you can expand this further. The best bit is that yeah, uh, yeah. the moment you start seeing those lines and angles, everywhere you look, you start seeing that. You start deconstructing the world around you into lines and angles and shape, form, color, texture. So literally there are times that I'm walking and I, you look up at the sky and you say, oh my God, this is such a beautiful sky. Maybe a little bit of cobalt and cerulean. So you start, everything is broken down into the palette that you're familiar with. That is, that's ideal. Yeah. That's, that's exciting. And it's also uh, you never know where your trigger for your creativity comes from. Like it could be something so tiny, which otherwise you may not notice. Exactly. But it just triggers off. And, yeah. yeah. So. Cool. So please uh, share these pictures when, when whenever you're done. And uh, Paru, one, yeah. uh, I don't know, you must be going to a physiotherapist or somebody also, no? What I can suggest that worked for me was, uh, uh, have you tried what, what chair are you sitting on? Is it up to your neck? Okay. No. Okay, so I have a chair that, that's up to my shoulder blades. I'm sitting taller also. Yeah. My, my elbows are straight down. So I don't do this. My earlier table, I used to do this. So my shoulders used to get frozen. And then once in a while, I will link my hands behind the chair and hold them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. no, not not from the sides. Stretch. No, that doesn't do anything. You take them all. From the, above. Yeah, all the way back. So you oh, need above the back. Of the yeah, you okay. need a slightly short. A lower chair. Yeah. 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 And Shorter if that, back. If that doesn't happen, you can just try to hold your elbows from the back. Just this, so you, yeah, yeah. Them like that and try to extend them out. Yeah. yeah, so every few, every 20 minutes or so, you need to put an alarm, do that, walk around, and then come back and work. I think that's the problem. Remember, when you're working, you tend to forget. At least I forget. Yeah, I forget. I forget. I'm getting an ache in my butt, so I have to get that cushion. I forget to get up and I forget to drink water. My bottle exactly. is on my table, but I will forget to. I think alarms work. I, I've set alarms now. Uh -huh. Some things. Yeah. My dad had set an alarm for water and it worked very well. So just a glass, you know, he has every 20 minutes, he sets an alarm. Yeah. No, this thing of sitting that, uh, you know, the tailbone thing I've only developed in the last month. I've been sitting a lot, what with the calligraphy, then this, then the other sitting. So I've never sat so much in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. yeah. Because of that, the tailbone is giving trouble. So now I've got me a cushion, yeah. which is specially for that. So I can sit longer. Okay. Yeah, we have to do all these things. Yeah. So like, uh, I remember uh, this was for Somebody, when we are teach, learning Vedanta, that yoga is a is a big part of even studying philosophy. And I couldn't, I didn't know what the connection was. Absolutely agree. <laughs> and the, Absolutely agree. The reason given was so that you can sit in one place for a long time whenever you have Absolutely. to sit. You can't gain anything spiritually unless you learn to meditate. But if your body is not going to cooperate, then your your focus is completely shifted. I thought, how have they tied these two things together? Physical and it's absolutely perfect. Yeah, so you have to be physically nimble so that you can stay still. Yes. <laughs> and stretches are important. Stretches are important. Because you get kind of your muscles get cramped and then after some time everything aches. So you have to stretch. Yeah. You tell me to sit and paint for hours, I can do that. But you tell me to meditate, I can't meditate for even five minutes. My God, my mind will be all over the place. Yeah, neither can it's... I. I'm not a meditating person. 
But yeah. I need, for me, my meditation that painting, painting is meditation. Or the artwork is meditation. meditation. Yeah, true. Calligraphy is meditation. Every day, yeah. you have to sit with uh, quietly looking at one thing. That's it. You're done. With the meditation. Yeah. <laughs> I guess meditation is what we what we do with it, right? And what it gives us. Hmm. I think it's what focus. It's like yeah. Just it's focus. focus. Single focus, pointed yeah. focus. That's meditation. Single pointed focus. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you next thank week. You. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I will sign up for. Uh, next month as well. Okay. Oh, thank lovely. Amulia's yeah. butterflies. Amulia's butterflies. Oh. Lovely. Very nice. Very equidistant. My Just, right side is much larger. Yeah. Try to I should probably do another. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Lovely. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.